Welcome back, and I'm so looking forward to the next panel. What the think tanks are thinking with our think tanks. Let me introduce them. Mr Simon Cowan from the Centre for Independent Studies, which I would say is in the centre. Oh, the, 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 the happy centre. The, exactly. the happy centre. In Melbourne, we're joined by Emma Dawson from Per Capita, which would say it would be on the left, wouldn't we, Emma? Fair enough, Janine. Oh, OK, that's all right. And from the IPA, Simon Breeny, no doubt you're on the right, Simon. And proud. Oh, we're on the free, the free market right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> free market right. There you are. I won't go into my factions. We did that a couple of weeks ago. Look, we will just start on terror. I was just talking to um, Greg Barton on it. I'm not going to go into the philosophical, even the political side, except for the argument that uh, someone's going to pay. Obviously, it's all about paying. Now, the blueprint today was putting a lot of it back on the councils, which is going to be a big ask, I think. Um, is business going to have to pay Simon too? Well, look, I think ultimately business is probably going to find, you know, some element of this that they're going to need to contribute. I mean, your example of shopping centres are a good one. It's a large space where there's a lot of people and no one wants to be the owner of the shopping centre where there's a terrorist attack. So I'm sure that these businesses are already looking at elements and things that they need to do to make their, their places more safe. I mean, ultimately, security is a state government issue and I I suspect that a lot of this should be not only paid for but organised by the state governments who have responsibility for things like the police. And, you know, we see this all the time that a lot of these things end up devolved to the federal level instead of being managed by the levels that they should be, like the states and the local councils. Simon, it, it all very well to say who's responsible, but I notice, um, you know, the airports, the private companies that own them, they're always whinging about having to pay one cent more. Um, and we're already paying a fortune on this. This, this is going to be an issue isn't it? Yeah, well, of course, companies are always going to try and avoid costs <laughs> if they can do so. Um, I mean, look, it's, it's really important to say that it's in the interests of concert venues, it's in the interests mm. of airports, it's in the interests of other public Sporting groups um, that make Whether, a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, <laughs> uh, sure, sure. But I mean, I mean, the point I want to make is that it is in their interests to make sure that their mm. patrons are safe. So they're going to make sure that they're spending money on security measures. They do so anyway. Um, you know, if there's an extra requirement for things that they might not otherwise be looking at uh, from government, then, you know, obviously there's going to be an extra cost there that they weren't already covering. But I think that, you know, really th those costs are going to be at the margins unless there's going to be a massive, massive imposition from government. It doesn't look as though there's going to be. Really where all the fight is going to be is not private venues, it's not private spaces, it's public spaces. And it looks as though, as the federal government outlined today, a lot of pressure is going to be exerted on local councils. But you know what? Geez, local councils spend a lot of money on some rubbish these days, so I'd like to see Literally. them redirect oh, some of those exactly. funds. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't think they spend enough <laughs> on rubbish, Simon. I think yeah, they spend... Yeah. Too much on the not rubbish, not the rubbish. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, you, you there's are, a lot of nonsense at the local council. Where you're council sitting level. down there in Victoria is central to that. I see a second council's doing more rubbish about Australia Day when they should be worried about security. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a whole other issue. Emma, um, security and cost, and, and now the citizen and the workers are going to have to do more. I did like Greg Barton's argument when I was saying, you know, poor hospitality workers can barely do their checklist on what they're paid. Uh, he did say, we do fire drills, responsible companies get people, people are going to have to get used to doing, you know, terrorism drills as well and yeah, look, look for things. Just, just like those of us at, at airports have got used to the, you know, increased <coughs> security measures at airports, that's obviously something that's now spreading further throughout society and I think, um, you know, there is going to be a call on both private, the private sector and the public sector to do more. Um, as Simon said, it's in, it's in the interests of businesses that want to attract customers to ensure that those customers feel safe and secure. Um, so, but I think, I think we're, on a, we're all three of us on an agreement on, on this, that the, the real ticket. interest is mm. going to be... We're on a unity ticket. The interesting thing's going to be which level of government steps up and is responsible for those public spaces. I don't think anybody here... It's in anyone's interest to see a fight or an argument about that. Nobody wants to be on the wrong side of this, so well, maybe we'll see some cooperation. Well, Emma, I know you say it, and it's lovely that you're all on a unity ticket, but we in... Uh, while you might have the silliest councils down there in Victoria, we in <laughs> Sydney have just seen the most ludicrous fight between the state government and the city council over moving a few tents 
out of the centre of Martin Place, which is, you know, ground central for security. So they couldn't even get that organised. Does not all go well. Let's get to the other um, main issue of the week. And again, I want to look at it, given that you're the thinkers, uh, not just from the usual political point of view, the citizenship fiasco. Let's not get drilled down into, you know, who's doing what wrong here. It's just beyond ridiculous. Someone's going to pay for these High Court challenges, though, Simon Cowan, and this is going to drag on. Now, I notice uh, Sydney Morning Herald business section had quotes from David Murray from the Future Fund, Roger Corbett, a number of business leaders saying, you know, at some point, this does have an impact on, on our investment image, whatever. We've got to sort this out, don't we? We the grown -ups do. grown-ups have got to get in charge. Well, uh, are there any grown-ups left in Parliament, and will there be any grown-ups left in a couple of months' time? Look, I think what we're seeing here is more evidence of the fact that politicians seem to believe themselves to be above the rules. They're more than happy to put hundreds and thousands of pages of regulation with minute detail about all the things that businesses and companies and ordinary people have to do. But when it comes to them, it's, oh, no, no, I couldn't possibly be expected to know country. that I was, a, <laughs> I was a dual citizen. And sure, the wording of the section is explicitly clear. <laughs> But we really need the High Court to try and come up with a magic reason as to why the rules shouldn't apply to me. And that is the thing about this that I find most annoying. It's not even, and as someone who hates government spending, it's not even the taxpayers are going to have to pay for this. It's that we have all these people who make the rules who think the rules don't apply to them. Simon, this is the issue, isn't it? The High Court has enough on its plate to deal with with actual cases. They don't move quickly. If we don't have a straight audit, and I'm blaming both sides here. You could have cases coming up. This could drag on for years. Yeah, that's technically right. I mean, um, we have no idea beyond the seven uh, over whom there are clear question marks that have been raised now how much further this problem goes. I mean, there could be any number of others who haven't done their own homework where um, journalists haven't done uh, the sort of the digging that we've seen them. around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, exactly. Um, you know, uh, uh, barristers haven't uh, haven't gone out and had a look at uh, uh, the the. I mean, you know, the minutiae of, of citizenship rules of other countries. I mean, one of the problems that the High Court is going to have to deal with here is that um, the language in Section 44, although it's very clear. Um, it's got to make this decision about whether or not someone's engaged in enough of the sort of investigatory uh, conduct that you'd expect of a person for whom, for instance, their, their parent or their grandparent was born overseas and by virtue of their grandparents being born overseas, they mm. themselves have the citizenship yeah. of another country. I mean, if you're bo born overseas yourself, of course there are question marks about whether you're a dual citizen. I think that's completely fair enough. But I think beyond that, there are some very strange citizenship rules around the country, and the High Court's going to have to make a ruling on this. The, the one thing I do want to say about this, though, that is, I think, incredibly important, is that the High Court should be making this a matter of priority. I think that they should be sure. trying to resolve this issue and handing down, hearing the case and I, handing down a judgment within, within a couple of months. I mean, the fact that they're looking at a hearing date next month, I think, is, uh, is just unacceptable. I, I, I think it should be heard as soon as possible. I agree, Simon. And when I said it could drag on, I didn't mean that the High Court wasn't. But as I understand it, they've got to look at each individual case. This isn't a job lot. Some might be double. So any new ones that come yep. up are then going to go separately, hence why we need this audit. Now, Emma, this is not partisan because the two major parties are refusing to do this in the crossbenches. Can you explain to me the rationale in having this cloud over everyone? and why we always talk about bipartisanship. Isn't this an obvious one? Well, you would think so. I think maybe the two major parties are, are digging their heels in because they have the processes in place and, and as yet we haven't seen any clear cases from either the Liberal Party or the Labor Party of anyone the that's The Deputy been PM's up in just this. being caught, though, that's starting to uh, get a well, bit serious. Well, there's the National Party, so, you know, I think, you know, the fact that the, the Libs and, the, and Labor both feel that they have processes in place uh, could be one very strong reason why they're resisting an audit. Um, but, look, it, it's essential that this is dealt with and dealt with quickly. Uh, it's not just a matter of whether or not um, the Deputy Prime Minister or the Deputy Leader of the Nationals resign their Cabinet positions. Uh, we have up to seven Senators voting on legislation that may not be eligible to sit in our Parliament. And we can debate as much as you want to debate the, the reasonableness of the rules um, in, a, in the 21st century when you know one in four Australians has a parent that was born overseas. Um, but the fact is the rules are the rules. They've been there for 100 years. 
any in, uh, up and coming parliamentarian should know that. Mm. And if they can't do their homework, uh, then they shouldn't be voting on legislation while there's a cloud over their eligibility to sit in parliament. Well, there's so much more we can do on this. And I did have a quote from Nick, you know, grab from Nick Xenophon, who called himself a media tart this week, but like mm. the redhead, let's. Uh, Let's not give him that moment. We'll give it to him later in the other panel. Um, but look, let's get to something that you get a bit overtaken by all this. Last weekend at about this time, Scott Morrison was uh, dropping... Well, I don't know who drops the story, but the certain papers had a story uh, about a huge... claiming that Labor was going to have a $160 billion hit for taxes uh, and then lost in the citizenship the next day. Uh, it sort of implied that it came from the budget parliamentary office, that there'd been some costings done and they went, no, nah, it wasn't us, they said on Monday morning. So the so story sort of disappeared. Here's Scott Morrison just sort of following up on it. It was all a bit vague, but here he is about tax on Monday. Assumption about what the burden, uh, in current financial year, that burden would be equivalent at 25.7 per cent of the economy an extra 31 billion dollars in tax now you think you can just smash that on the top of your economy and it has no effect on jobs no effect on incomes no effect on growth i mean you've got to be kidding yourself these guys think you can just turn the tax dial to 11 and nothing happens now while i have argued that in all the silliness it is good to talk about things like tax um you don't add to the silliness, I guess, with the, with the figures. But um, Simon Breeny, it did all get a bit silly there. I mean, we should be talking about tax, but that figure of 160 billion is sort of nobody's come up with where it came from, and now it's gone quiet. If we're going to have a rational yeah. debate, it doesn't help the argument, does it? Yeah, well, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we're not sure exactly where this has come from. Uh, we've certainly got no breakdown of those figures. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not all that surprised that, uh, that this figure is out there. Um, you know, it's no surprise to anyone or it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that Bill Shorten is going to be looking at increasing a range of taxes in the lead up to the next federal election. He'll be looking for a mandate for those. Um, but I think that uh, without, you know, knowing exactly where this, these figures have come from, it's a bit difficult to, um, uh, to bat it around, to be honest. I think that uh, it was, as you say, it was dropped on, uh, on the Sunday night um, we were reading about it in Monday morning's papers. I was actually um, thinking that maybe we'd see a press conference from the Treasurer on uh, Monday at some point to put some more meat on the bones, but we haven't yet seen that. No, but I guess the IPA's position, and you do a lot obviously on tax, would be that the 160 might be an overkill, but Labor's going to kick your taxes up. That bit he's right about. Well, I, I don't think that... I mean, they've got a <laughs> massive social spending agenda, right? So they've got to pay for that somehow. Uh, they, don't, they, won't, they won't want to rack up debt uh, more than the sort of rate that it's increasing now. You know, they might do that as well, but, you know, I don't think it's any surprise. We'll see a lot of taxes coming from the Labor government. Um, but, you know, the, the Coalition government's been guilty of that too over the last few months. So uh, yep. it looks like a tax and spend agenda on both sides of the equation at this stage. Oh, OK, yeah, but now, look, we'll concede, without arguing about the figures, we'll concede that there's no evidence for them, so I'm not going to use the $160 billion figure, which is a shame because there is a lot of uh, money there that is going to go in the taxes and there's a question mark over it. But... Does it just show how silly the argument, I mean, trying to have a rational argument on tax is going to be? Because Bill Shorten was off talking same-sex marriage and other things this week. Even he wasn't really engaging in a proper this debate. This was not an attempt at a rational discussion about tax. This was a desperate grab for attention, uh, to get attention away from same-sex marriage and everything else that's going on in the dysfunction. But hold on, Bill Shorten uh, was out talking about same-sex marriage today. Doesn't he have better things to talk about today? Uh, well, well he's, he, he hasn't responded to this um, story from Scott Morrison because it's a non-story. I think, you know, the, the Treasurer is very foolish um, to, cite, to cite figures that, we, that he can show no evidence for, that the Parliamentary Budget Office came out and denied were theirs. Um, and, you know, shock horror, raise, uh, Labor's, going to, Labor's revenue raising measures, which it has announced for months now, are going to raise revenue, which is what, what tax is about. It's raising revenue to pay for services. So 
So, and it's not about Labor hitting families with big new taxes. It's about them closing loopholes on things like negative gearing, uh, capital gains tax, uh, family trusts. They've been very open about that. Uh, and I don't think that it should be surprising to anybody that Labor's uh, revenue raising tax, uh, tax changes are going to actually raise revenue to pay for services. But the, the foolish thing by Morrison was to try to, you know, the overreach in claiming that this was a, a figure that had been tested by the Parliamentary Budget Office. You don't normally see that kind of desperate grab for statistics and extrapolating figures and, and playing around with rubbery figures until we're in an election campaign. And I think it's another sign of desperation by this government. Simon, your think tank obviously looks at taxes too. Let's accept that it's not helpful when you throw around big figures like that during the debate. Um, does it make you despair a bit about a rational tax debate this week when everybody is sick of same-sex marriage, they're getting fed up with the citizenship, you think we could go back to the economy, but that's gone silly too. Yeah, and unfortunately, of course, for the Treasurer, in the same week that he was talking about all these tax increases, he's trying to get his Medicare levy Yeah. Passed. As somebody so, said, on a week he started blaming Labor for raising taxes, he proposed to Yeah, tax as soon them. as it looked like they were going to get their tax through, oh, look, raising taxes is fine. And the, it, the trouble that they're having is they don't really have a way to connect to the ordinary person on tax. And, and there is actually a, a story. In the next 18 months, someone on the minimum wage will go into the third tax bracket and will be paying a marginal rate of more than 30 cents in the dollar on the money they're earning. Now, they are not, by any stretch of the imagination, high-income earners. They are going to be paying more than a third of their extra dollars in income tax through bracket creep. Now, that is a really serious problem. That's going to be one of the biggest tax increases that you'll see. You know, talk about increases on family trusts and everything else. The increase on tax paid by people between the minimum wage and the median wage and the average wage, that is a huge amount of money and that's a big deal. But the government can't seem to talk about the issues, they can't get that connection to the people who are actually going to have to pay this tax. And until they start doing that, until they start getting people to understand what tax increases mean for them, they're not going to get any cut through in this at all. And when they keep doing things like increasing the Medicare levy and making those same people that they're trying to, to argue for tax cuts pay more in tax, there's no chance. Well, another issue, I'm going to get uh, the think tanks have all had reports and we're going to talk about two of them after the break. But before we go, I just want to ask on this economic issue, um, Simon Brini, the IPA came out with one because obviously jobs are the other issue. We saw uh, pretty good unemployment figures. That should be something good that Scott Morrison could talk about. Good luck with clear air on that one this week. But uh, you, the IPA had an interesting report about a problem in, in jobs at the moment, disappearing jobs for men. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And uh, really what this report talks about is one of the key issues in what we talk about from month to month is these unemployment figures. Now, um, unemployment's one measure, but it's actually not a very good measure of the participation rate in the economy and in the labour force. What it does is it says how many people in the labour force have decided not to... Uh, have, have, are, are still looking for work, but they're not able to find, find work. Um, what we've done is we've said, well, I think a better way of looking at this question is to say how many people are there who have decided to exit the labour force altogether, to give up on looking for work? And in particular, how many men are doing that? In the 1950s, about 96% of working age men between 20 and 54 were in the labour force uh, and we're down uh, now to uh, the mid-70s. So this is a very, very significant problem. Um, where we've gone from a very, very high participation rate for men in particular to a much, much lower participation rate in the economy. Um, and the biggest problem with men in particular exiting that is that they don't come back in. Once they're outside of the labour force, once they've stopped looking for work, they, uh, they won't come back again. So that's a very, very significant problem. And this terrific piece of research, which was done by a uh, research fellow at the Institute of Public Affairs, Gideon Rosner, looks at those issues. Um, there's also a great uh, video that he's put together to put up on our Facebook page to communicate the message of this to um, a younger audience in particular. But I think that this is one of those really, really interesting uh, stats that we sort of throw around. I mean, really the unemployment rate um, is almost useless when you see these participation rates declining over time. Emma, I'll just ask you quickly on it, because I'm sure uh, per capita has looked at it, but this issue of men in particular, we often hear about women, yeah. but this isn't an yeah. unusual one. 
Look, it's certainly true that um, the men's participation rate in the workforce has fallen over recent decades. Um, now, that's not in a, not directly due to women entering the workforce. Um, women's participation rate has gone up at the same time, but that's you know to be expected when we're seeing a major shift uh, in terms of women entering the workforce in the first place. Um, but I think it is I think it is a significant issue. It's one of the issues that um, leads to structural long-term unemployment. One of the things we have seen in recent decades is a lot of entry-level positions for men um, are no longer there. Jobs that were in in manufacturing and and so on. Um, we're seeing those industries. Do Decline, and it's it's a significant challenge um, for how we how we structure our working futures. A, a, a young person in year 12 today, male or female, can expect to have 17 jobs across their life course. Um, so the the days where you left school and you you went into an apprenticeship and you went into the, a firm and stayed there pretty much for life are uh, a distant memory for for mm. people today. Um, and our work and our workplace structures and our social security structures and our superannuation structures aren't keeping pace. Okay. Um, and I think it's an issue that everyone needs to be aware of. Okay, and if you're a journalist, 17 jobs, you'd be lucky to keep one in your life at the moment. <laughs> We're going to talk about media law reform after this short break. Stick with us. Welcome back. I'm here with our What the Think Tanks Are Thinking segment with Simon Breamy, Breeny, Emma Dawson and Simon Cowan. Now, look, uh, one of the things that got overlooked this week, we got... That close, that close to the long-awaited media law reform bill. It was that close. Everybody thought it was going to pass. There was a deal done with One Nation. Unfortunately, it might have been a little overreach because it was so anti-ABC, coward cowed out to One Nation so much, that Nick Xenophon then decided to withdraw his support. Back to the drawing board to get a deal with him now. Here's Nick Xenophon earlier this week. Unfortunately... Uh, the negotiations have stalled. Uh, we will continue to talk to the government in good faith. Uh, we believe we have an opportunity to get it right. Journalism in this country can flourish, that instead of losing hundreds of jobs, we can create hundreds of journalists' jobs. And that is something that, uh, at this stage, uh, the government um, is not prepared to support. And just to remind yourself that before she put on the, the black garb, uh, Pauline Hanson was meant to be involved in this. Here's what she was saying. This was what caused the problem with the ABC in that bill. What we are covering in this is a couple of aspects to the ABC, but it's broader than that because we're looking after the public's interest and in ensuring that they get a fair deal from not only the ABC, but in most in rural and regional areas. There is a legislative change to the ABC Charter which will insert the words fair and balanced. And I think it's very important because this is what the public want. Jump the gun a little there. Not only did it not get up, but if the Greens and Nick Xenophon do it, her much-hated ABC might actually get more money. So it's anyone's bet. I know people involved in this still quite hopeful there will be a deal. So this week, Simon Cowan, you wrote a piece, an op-ed piece in the AFR, where you said media companies have got to merge or fail. You basically, your argument was that based, more, take the shackles of government off. But isn't that exactly what they're trying to do and... It's politics that's getting uh, in the way. We all know where we should get to. So what do you think will happen or should happen now? Look, you wouldn't even have to have had that strip up there that said Nick Xenophon was a senator for South Australia. As soon as he started talking about our government could create hundreds of jobs for journalists. Mm. And I just thought, oh, isn't that the South Australian solution to everything? Let's just toss a billion dollars <laughs> of government money and we'll create jobs. Look, the problem we have here is that we're talking about the media industry as if it's this perfect model of diversity that we need to maintain at all costs, when in reality we have all of the major mastheads shedding staff by the hundreds. We have, you know, radio stations and TV stations posting massive losses or huge write-downs. The industry is in a lot of trouble. And what we've got is a situation where the legislators are trying to say, no, we need to keep this perfect situation that we have now, not realising that the market's going to have its way no matter what. So either we let these companies compete, we let them merge, we let them try and come up with a business model that works, 
without government because the alternative will be that we'll end up with Nick Xenophon's billion dollars for quality journalism. So just tell us what you think then, what looks like is going to be a compromise deal. Is that, in your view, the worst of both worlds because you're still going to have a lot of government shackles on? It is taking some off, but it's still going to have some. I mean, well, in an ideal world, you're never going to have open slather, are you? You're yet? probably not going to have open slather, but I think you need to, you need to look at this more realistically and say, what can we actually do to get these companies stable? What's a, what's a business model look like? And, and the issue with the ABC, with all due respect to One Nation, the problem I don't think is so much one of bias in as much as it is so much one of competition. And that's why, in particular, Fairfax is struggling so hard because they're competing with the ABC for a similar market. Well, you call for ABC and SBS, their, their extra channels, to just go. I, I did. Couldn't I think, agree with you more. You know, I think there's, there's probably a, a degree of duplication and a degree of overreach there that, that could be addressed in this situation. I, I'm very concerned about the idea of things like fair and balanced because they're, they're a subjective test and I think it's going to be very, very difficult to meet anyone's, you know, I don't think it's going to happen, so balance. let's not worry too much on that. Emma Dawson, you have uh, written on this issue, especially uh, the thing that uh, goes straight to the heart of every ABC viewer, children's television. But what do you make of the failure to get it past this week and um, what model we are going to end up with? And I don't think we should worry too much at the moment on the Pauline Hanson one. It looks like it's going to be a Nick Xenophon deal by the look of it now. Look, I think, uh, uh, other than the, the very last point that Simon made about the you know, impossibility of the terms fair and balanced and how subjective they are, I didn't agree with much of what he said, actually. I think <laughs> one of the problems is not... Um, the, the problem here is that we're talking about the media as if it's just another business. Uh, it's not just another business. It's an essential pillar in our democracy. It's the fourth estate. Um, and so to be just talking about the business model, um, the competitiveness of the industry, the jobs for journalists, those things are all very important. But what no one in this debate is talking about is the public interest. Pauline Hanson mentioned it there. I think she got it completely wrong. But the public interest, um, I think, has been actually quite well served by the delay in the Senate this week. Uh, I think the media laws are not a comprehensive package. They are a wish list from the industry. Um, now, most of them, actually, I agree with. I think the 75% reach rule is incredibly out of date. I worked for Stephen Conroy when he tried to repeal it. It should have been repealed years ago. The two out of three rule is the sticking point, of course, and that's something that Labor's not budging on. Um, and I think, actually, it's quite dangerous to think that we remove what may not be fit for purpose diversity um, regulations without something else in their place. This isn't just about journalism, it's not just about kids TV, it's not just about drama, it's not just about the viability of the industry, it's also about uh, the diversity of voices, the reliability of those voices yes. and the information that the but public Emma, gets. But that's in an ideal world. The fact is Channel 10's in receivership, Fairfax is... Channel uh, 10's in receivership because its owners yes, wanted it to but be the in fact receivership is, to put they pressure could on be, the parliament they could to pass be, these laws. The only people who might swoop in and take Fairfax, for example, could be an overseas private equity fund, which you don't want. The fact is that the market's moving the private ahead of politics. Channel 9 a few years ago and it seemed to have gone pretty well so far. For so them. I, I, I don't okay. know that that's the worst thing that can happen. Okay. I think the worst thing that can happen is that we end up with a situation where we have uh, one proprietor in control of pay television, free-to-air television, newspapers, things like the anti-siphoning list then come into play, a whole suite of regulations that are not being looked at in this package. Okay. I think the parliament needs to take its time and I'm oh, glad I, it's I agree with that but I think the concern is the one proprietor will be the government. And it will be a massive injection of government funds Simon, and we'll see Simon, the ABC and SBS debate about I content rolled out across the whole nonsense. industry. I don't okay. know exactly what Nick Xenophon's proposing, but I believe actually that the measures that are in, in play around public interest journalism are more about tax deductibility rather okay. than a massive Simon cash injection Simon Brini, I'm going to give you the final word on that. We've only got a couple of minutes. Where do you stand on the media law changes? Will they get up? Who will win? Will they be any good or just not much better than what they were? Well, I think you've got to be suspicious whenever anyone, uh, politicians, political commentators, uh, researchers at think tanks start using the term public interest because <laughs> the public interest is best served when consumers are free to, in the media landscape, buy the media, consume the media that they wish to. And um, they're not able to do that if media companies are hamstrung by outdated regulations, as we have in Australia. And I think that the government 
including the Communications Minister, Senator Mitch Fifield, is doing a wonderful job in trying to deal with some of those issues. Um, frankly, I wish they'd go a lot further. I think that the package that they've put forward is a compromise. Um, and there's a lot more that could be done. Well, there's yes, a lot more that no, no doubt see, will be done there's over the next few years. No use even wondering about that when they can't even get through the basic this week. So I think yeah, it's well, a matter I mean, of what you playing, can. Xenophon's playing politics on this one. Oh, I mean, for him just to wait for the next uh, leader of the Xenophon party. Once he's out as a dual citizen, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> right. deal with the next one. Rebecca Sharkey, there you go. We've actually run out of time, and obviously we could argue on media law um, till the cows come home or till the. Senators are declared valid or whatever. It's going to come back in a couple of weeks. I feel sorry for Emma Dawson, who's been through this God knows how many times before. Um, anyway, I want to thank our think tank panellists tonight. Emma Dawson, Simon Breeny, Simon Cowell. We'll see you all in a few weeks' time when probably not much will have changed, but we can <laughs> go further on.